give a lift from what that being helpful. Hey everyone, thanks for coming. I know it's towards the end of the semester, but this will be really beneficial. I know last year I learned a lot. And even the winning team from last year met their co-founders through Abby, so that's kind of a cool story. Um, so first first thing you on the uh, on your chairs you got a quarter sheet for investing them on uh, Sunday. It's kind of late, but we thought it'd be a really good time if you have an idea and want to get some feedback from some alumni. We've got um, five or six different mentors, one's still seeing if she can come, who are all alumni, uh, lawyers, um, computer science people, uh, founders, we've got a few different marketing. So we have a lot, all the different facets of your business to go and get feedback. Um, so it's super beneficial going into the break. Also, uh, Tech Trek Boston is going to PayPal Start Labs this um, Friday. So there's a couple of different um, there's a couple different signs around here. It's kind of a long Bitly link, but you can sign up um, there with the IS Academy. And then lastly, um, introduce our speaker, Abby Fitner. Thanks a lot for coming out tonight. Um, she's the hacker in residence at the Harvard Innovation Lab. Has started a few different things here in Boston. Um, the big data hacker lab, right? Hacker. Yeah, hackerspace. Hacker Hack, yeah, yeah hackerspace. Um, <laughs> Hack Boston, and among a few other things, she used to be the startup evangelist at Microsoft. So let's give her a big round of applause. Hello. So thank you for coming and braving the snow. And I realize this date wasn't awesome because at Harvard, at least, like after Thanksgiving, we lose all of the students. So thank you all. I promise to try to be entertaining. And I even, speaking of being the evangelist at Microsoft, that was a couple of years ago. One of the things that I did was to help startups. And so like I bought books for startups, so I just found a couple of my closets. So I even have free books that I'll have to creatively figure out how to give out to you guys. Um, so um, as I said, I'm Abby Fickner. A lot of people know me as Hackership because I do the Hackership blog on how to build better technology. Um, my background is I'm a software developer, and somewhere along the lines, Microsoft said, hey, you should come be our evangelist for startups. And I entered this whole new track of just going out and helping startups. So I worked with hundreds of startups, which is pretty awesome and amazing, and I love it. And I want to share with you guys some of what I learned tonight. So I want to start off by getting a feel for who's here. Um, they say that their dream team for a startup is a hacker, a hipster, and a hustler. So a hacker to build a product, a hustler to bring in business and make it like a billion dollar business, and a hipster to make it an amazing experience for the users. So who here would identify with being a hacker, the person who's going to be building the product for your startup? Can you raise your hands up? We have to have at least one or else I'm just going to cry and go home. <laughs> okay, we have like three kind of. What about, you can be more than one, what about a hustler, the person who's going to be bringing, bringing in the business? Awesome, okay, so you guys are making the money, I'll talk to you guys. And then hipsters, the guys who are designers, product people, going to get an amazing experience. Okay, and so we have some undecided, that's okay. These are all good roles to be in at a startup. So um, right now, you guys are in such an awesome time to be working on startups because, I mean, I'm a tech genius, so I'm a little biased, but this is a pretty amazing time because technology is making so many things possible that weren't possible before, and it's opening up all these opportunities for companies to do things that are innovative and disruptive and are doing things that nobody even ever thought of before. So one of my favorite examples is 3D printers, which are just leading to us uh, from kind of mass product, mass production to mass customization and allowing people to make things that are so unique. And so that people are 3D printing human organs, they're 3D printing food, <laughs> so NASA has started 3D printing food for its astronauts, um, 3D printing cars, so Ernie 3D printed the world's cheapest and most fuel efficient car and they're about to drive it across the country on 10 gallons of fuel, which is pretty crazy. And then, of course, combine everything that's going on um, with mobile and cloud computing that means that technology can follow us anywhere that we are. Um, and combine that with things like what 3D printing and Arduinos and Raspberry Pis are doing to make it so much easier to create physical objects. Now we've got this whole concept of Internet of Things where we're saying, hey, let's take the technology out of our computers, out of our phones, and put them into the objects that we care about. Um, so, like David Rose created an umbrella that tells the weather. And so you can imagine it in um, an umbrella stand near the front door. So as it senses you off past, it'll blink if it's going to rain, so you can pick it up and take it with you. Or Valor created a bicycle that not only gives you directions, but ride, tracks all of your riding stats. And Happy, this is a little scary, created a food that monitors your eating to help you eat more healthily. So we are seeing everything from self-driving cars to mind-controlled robots, pretty crazy, 
Um, even things that we thought of as being very low-tech, like reading the news, GameNet just recently announced that they are coming out with virtual reality journalism, so you can experience the day's news, or get to the, the day's news, not by reading it, but actually experiencing it in virtual reality. Or another thing we might think of is low-tech like gardening, which I think that I'd want to do to de-stress after experiencing the day's news firsthand. Does that sound, doesn't that sound stressful? Um, <laughs> a team out of MIT created a produce appliance that will grow fruits and vegetables right in your kitchen. And so as you look at all of these amazing companies that are coming about now, um, doing things that nobody thought was possible before, the question is which ones of them are going to survive? And which ones of them are going to be part of our future? Because as exciting as this is, the stats are pretty bleak. The stats are that 9 out of 10 new products fail, which is pretty terrible, right? And when you look at how many guys are creating tech startups, how many people are thinking about doing a startup that has some kind of tech involved in it, software, or hardware? So what, do you, what are other people doing? People are doing something non-tech. Not an idea. All right, I'm going to come back to you and make you guys give me some ideas that you have. So I want to hear. But at least in the tech space, the startups aren't failing because the technology doesn't work. Like, we have the technology. Startups are failing because they're not finding a market that is right for them. Um, so a really great example of this, or a really frightening example of this, depending on how you look at it, is Actuality Systems, which was a company here in Boston, so you might have heard of them. They created a holographic 3D display. So instead of outputting your display to a monitor, you actually output it to a hologram. That's pretty badass, right? And they created it, they got it working, and then they spent the next 10 years trying to find a market for this. And finally, they had to shut their business down because they weren't able to find a market all they were able to do was sell off the tech license for the technology. And so what's really interesting is um, a survey was done into the single biggest predictor of failure for startups. So does anyone want to take a guess at what this is? It's something that startups do, but if they do this thing, that's the single biggest indicator that they're going to fail. Yeah. Marketing? Mar market? Marketing? Like, mar like they fail to do marketing? Or, like or they do marketing. Like they're doing it too really early bad. before like they like they don't let like the product speak for itself. Like they're trying to push it too hard. Okay, trying to push it too hard, good. They wait too long uh, to develop like, the perfect product before releasing it. They don't like give out, you know, prototypes. <laughs> yes, that's a very good lean startup. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else want to take a guess? Yeah. Monetizing too soon. Monetizing it too soon. So tell me what you mean by that. It means uh, you instead of developing the product and finding a niche market for it, and uh, going forward from there, they straight away try to get a market where they can start monetizing instead of helping the market to help develop the product further. Okay. Okay. That's good. Um, failure to do market research and see if there's a need for the product. Failure to do market research and see if there's a need. Yes, these are all things that startups that are, should avoid. But actually, what he, what John Saul found when he did the survey is that the single biggest predictor of startup failure is sticking to the initial business plan, which is pretty scary, right? Does anyone take a guess why that is? I feel like some of you were kind of hinting at it. Yeah. Yeah, because generally startups are like the first company in that space, so the initial plan would, which, which you would have probably figured out in a room would not be something which would work well in the business and then you pivot or something. Yes, exactly. So I don't know if you guys could hear him, but he basically said what my next slide is going to say, <laughs> um, which is you're doing something that no one's done before, right? And so how do you know? You're just taking guesses, and so if you stick to that, that's not really a recipe for success. Um, but at the same time, this notion, if like, you really think about it, is scary. Because anytime you're doing any new venture, the way that you figure out if you're on track or not, like even that language, on track, means are you tracking according to plan. And so if sticking to the plan means you're going to fail, then it's pretty confusing, right? Like, how do you know what's going to work? Mm -hmm. And so as, I'm sorry, what's your name? Mine? Yes. Shalom. Shell? Shallop. Shallop. So as Shallop has already kind of said what the slide is, um, in the old days, the conventional wisdom was, before we start do start a company, let's actually take the time to figure out if it's going to be viable or not. Let's go figure out you know, what the product is, who we're going to be selling it to, how we're going to reach that, those customers, what our partners are going to be, what our cost structure is going to be, what we're going to sell it for, all this information to figure out if we've got this perfect business or not. But the thing is, just like he said, you're doing something by definition that's never been done before, so how do you know any of that information up front? You don't. All you have are guesses. And so if you put all that together and then you blindly move forward on that, that's pretty much a recipe for failure. 
And so conventionalism today is to recognize that all you have are guesses and then to figure out how you can move forward based on that. And that's kind of where Lean Startup comes in. So Lean Startup is this methodology that takes a lot of principles from things like Lean that says instead of guiding our startups, building our startups according to guesses, we can actually guide them with lots of knowledge. So, um, John asked me to kind of walk through the steps of entrepreneurship, which is a little tricky because every startup is a little bit different. But here are some general steps that I've seen startups that are successful take, <coughs> moving from their initial idea up to launching their product. So I'm going to walk through these today. <coughs> so the very first one is find your idea. So I said I was going to come back to this. Maybe I should give out a book. Um, I want to hear what some of your guys' ideas are. Or you guys are all here because you want to do startups, right? So theoretically, you all have ideas. Is that true? <laughs> will someone share with me an idea, and you will get a startup? <coughs> So I, I, uh, I work at high school, I work at Brighton High School, I run an after school program for high school students helping them get into college and prepare for the SAT. Um, a big issue that I've seen is a lot of students who, you know, their parents might be immigrants, um, you know, they're you know, low income, they don't have the opportunity to explore career interests, so a lot of them don't know they want to do business or don't know that, you know, there's so many career options for them. So just. Um, I'm thinking of like a social venture. I don't have it all figured out yet. That's okay. Something uh, very similar to mentorship where college students can go to the high school, uh, you know, do workshops. If you're a finance major, you can go do a finance workshop. You know, show these juniors and seniors that a lot of what they do in their daily lives relates to business and that they might be interested in a career in that in the future that can help them with choosing what college they want to go to. Nice. Very cool. I like it. So here you go. Does anybody else want to share their idea? So I can tell you that as entrepreneurs, you should always, always want to jump at every opportunity to share your idea. Because for one, the more ears that you have listening to it, the more people who might, you might find that are excited about it that want to join you and help you, the more feedback that you're getting that's only going to make things better. Um, and the more you can just try out new wording and see if that resonates with people or not. So people should be jumping at that. So does anybody else want to? share their idea. Okay, I'm going to let you off the hook right now, but I might come back to So I think what's interesting is a lot of times when I ask people to share their startup idea, they get really nervous because they think, oh my god, I've got to come up with this really cool, sexy sounding idea. So I don't know if that's what's going through you guys, right? Um, but Paul Graham, do you guys know who Paul Graham is? One of the founders of Y Combinator. He has this awesome blog. You should check it out. Um, he wrote an article on how to get startup ideas. And he says the way to get startup ideas is not to try to think of startup ideas. Because if you try to just think up startup ideas, you're just trying to come up with something that sounds cool and sexy and has no basis in reality, and that's not a good basis for a startup. Instead, what you want to think of are problems. And ideally, problems that you yourself have, because then you really understand that space. And so then the question is, OK, so I have this idea, and it's really fuzzy, and maybe I can't even articulate it yet. How do I get from that? up to figuring out what my product is. And so when Lean Startup, rather than coming up with this entire huge business plan, this really long document that is probably going to be wrong, we use a business model canvas. Or in Lean, we sometimes use a Lean canvas, which is just an alternative of that. And you guys seen this before? OK, so some of you have. So briefly, this is instead of, you still want to think through your business, right? Figure out if you're on the right track or not. But instead of spending a bunch of months coming up with this long document, you want to do it on one page. And just get a snapshot. You get that these are guesses, but let me just get it down on paper, what I think is going to happen with my startup. What problem am I solving? Who am I solving it for? What does my solution look like? How am I different and better than what other people are going to use? How am I bringing in money? What are my costs going to be? Just kind of get that down on the one pager and say, OK, does this feel like it could be a viable business? If so, I get that these are just guesses, but now I've got them down on paper as kind of a stake in the ground that I can start moving forward with and validating if they're correct or not. So nonetheless, this can be pretty intimidating if all you have is a very fuzzy, high-level idea that you can't even articulate very well yet. <laughs> so I like to have people start with, what problem are you solving? So kind of go back to Paul Graham's advice, and who are you solving it for? And I'm going to take a silly example from a few years ago. Um, a few years ago, for some reason, like everybody was creating recipe apps. I don't know why, but everybody thought that was like the coolest thing in the world to do. And so, like every fifth entrepreneur I talked to, I'd be like, "What are you? What are you working on?" They're like, "Well, I'm building a recipe app." I'm like, "Okay, that's cool. Um, 
what, what problem is it that you're solving? And they say, well, I guess I'm solving the problem that you can't find recipes. So okay, that's the problem. Then who are you solving it for? And they say to me again and again that, oh, well, I want to make a ton of money. So I want to have like a million billion users. I want to have the broadest audience that I possibly can. And so I'm going to create a recipe app for anyone who cooks. So let me ask you guys, um, I know you're in college, I didn't cook at all when I was in college, but maybe you guys will be different than me. How many people in here cook? Even like mac and cheese or something. Okay, okay, and how many of you guys can't find recipes, don't know how to find recipes? Right, because there's like Google. So don't do something like this, right? I kind of equate thinking like this, going, oh, I want to appeal to as many customers as possible, as being like one of those people who tries to make everybody like them, and the result is that they're just kind of boring and nobody really likes them that much. <laughs> and so you guys don't want to do that because you want to be interesting, you want your startup to be interesting. And so I feel like there's a couple of different obvious approaches that you can take from this. One is to kind of just really drill down on a problem. So if we broaden recipes a little bit um, and think about food in general, and if you're really interested in doing something with food and think about what's a problem with food, there's tons of problems with food, you know, there's too much sugar in our diets, the America is like so much obesity and everything, and so everyone's on a diet. So what if we pick that and say, okay, that's definitely a problem, because people need to lose weight and they don't know how. Okay, so then who's the customer that you're solving that for? We could say dieters, but if everyone's on a diet, then that's kind of like saying anyone who cooks, that isn't very interesting. So hone in, like think about who do you know? Who are you excited about helping out, right? So maybe because you guys are in college, maybe you want to help dieters in college. And now if you can expand your idea a little from recipe app, which maybe isn't very interesting, this opens up, suddenly it lets you get so much more interesting so fast. So maybe what you're trying to do is, do you guys still use the term freshman 15? Is that like a thing? Okay. <laughs> so maybe what you want to do is come up with an app to beat the freshman 15, right? And now that opens up so many possibilities because you've gone so specific. So maybe you partner with Boston College and you figure out the menus that are at the dining hall, what they have to offer, right? And you can do like a Tinder style app where you can say this is what I want to eat or not what to eat, right? And at the end of the day, it tells you what your calories are, right? Or maybe it can help you find activities, like physical activities that are fun, not just going to the gym that are around college. All these different things come up just because you've gotten more specific. And the truth is, there's a lot of dieters in college, that's still a really big market. So that's a much more interesting way to go than trying to be something that appeals to everybody. Another way that you can go is to really think about the customer um, and think about who are kind of my people, like who am I really passionate and excited about helping. Um, so, thinking back to food, maybe you're somebody who has really like huge diet, dietary restrictions. You can't eat that much, right? And so you want to help other people like you because it's just kind of a pain that you can't eat everything that you want to. Um, so maybe you want to go after people with serious food restrictions like allergies. Now that you've figured out who those people are, even if you don't know what to do for them, you can start talking to them or maybe you're one of them and figure out what's a big problem that they have. So you might imagine that they have a really big problem eating out of restaurants because you don't know exactly what you're going to get. You can't really quite trust what the waiter says. Um, and some people can get very sick if the restaurant gets it wrong, right? So that's a serious problem. And so now you can say, okay, I've got something a little bit more well-defined and I can start moving forward with that to start figuring out what is a product that might be useful for the people. So that brings us to step number two, which is to start small. I get blinded every time I can go that. Um, so this kind of, I think, goes against a lot of people's mental models of how startups are. I think people think, go big or go home, baby, right? Um, but the truth is, how do you start go from your big vision of what you want to do to like a billion users, right? So you want to be the next Facebook. Facebook has a billion users. How do you build an app from day one that has so many features that it's going to be able to appeal to a billion different users? And even if you could, how would you even convince a billion different users to use your app when they've never even heard of you before? Like, would you guys get on the next Facebook if no one you knew was using it? And so, I don't know how that happens. That doesn't happen, I guess, is the, the thing. And what happens, if you look at a lot of big companies that are successful today, what you will see is that they actually started very small. So, um, I think of a startup as sort of a search, initially, for trying to figure out the intersection between our big vision of what we want to do and what reality can actually accommodate today. And so we often figure this out by doing small experiments. So Microsoft, for example, started as a way to um, program Altair, so the, so the basic programming language for Altair. So I don't know, do you guys know Altair? It was like the first ever home computer. It was like basically window lights and toggle switches. <laughs> um, 
So I don't know how many of these there were, but I think only a few thousand, right? That's not a big one. Or Facebook, which is sort of the quintessential Facebook, started, of course, just at Harvard, and there's only 20,000 students there. And so the real mental model that you should have in your head for how a startup operates is this, is you start with your big vision, absolutely, of what you want to do, but then you go small, and you figure out a way to dominate a very small niche market. And once you do that, you can build on that traction to go bigger and bigger and get more successful. The reason that you want to do this is really all about traction. It's such a hard thing as a startup. No one's ever heard of you. Why is anyone going to use you? But if you can figure out this niche market, these very specific customers, then all you have to figure out is that one thing that they're dying for and build that. Right? So Facebook didn't have to build all the features that it has today. It just had to build a centralized student directory for Harvard, which was way simpler, and it was interesting. Right? Um, and then once they've done that, then they could say, okay, let's start expanding to some other schools, and they could add more features, and now let's start expanding beyond schools, right? And you can build on that to get that traction. So that brings us to step number three, is what you want to do is make sure that you deeply understand your customers, so you can understand what that one thing is that they're dying for. And I think a really great example of this is Dropbox. So when Drew Houston, the founder of Dropbox, went to VCs to try to raise money, they really discouraged him. They said, I don't know why you're in this space, because there's already like a million billion startups, cloud storage startups out there. What are you doing? Um, and Drew said, yeah, but do you use any of them? So the difference was a lot of these competitors that were trying to do these cloud backup systems um, were trying to appeal to a ton of users, and they were creating all these features in real complexity, and Drew understood who his initial market was, I think because he was one of them, and he was just going after the hardcore techies, who just wanted to be able to transfer files between their devices, right? And so all he had to do was find a solution that was better than using USB sticks, which most people were using at the time, right? And then it was interesting to them. them. And then he could build on that, and now today he's at companies, and I think even my mom uses it, and they have like 300 million users, right? So it's okay to go small, even though that feels very unintuitive. So, Lean Startup kind of says that building your product is incredibly important, but building your customers is just as, if not more important, than building your product. And so every single person at your startup should be doing one of these things. They should either be working on building your product, or they should be working on figuring out who your customer is and building their customers. So this is kind of interesting. Um, a lot of times when people like VCs evaluate startups to try to figure out if they're going to be successful or not, there's three key things that they look at, right? They look at the team who's on the startup, they look at the market they're after, and they look at the product they're developing. Um, so I'm curious what you guys think. Who thinks that of these three, team is the most important thing for a startup? Okay, so about a third of you. Um, how many people think market is most important? Nobody? Okay. And how many people think product is most important? One. Okay, so you guys are very team focused. That's good. <laughs> I feel like I could actually argue for any three of these. Um, but what's interesting is, you know who Mark Andreessen is? He was the founder of Netscape, the investor now. He makes a really interesting argument, which is that market trumps everything. Because in a really good market, your customers are so dying for a solution that you can have a not very good product put together by a team that's making all sorts of mistakes, and you're still going to kill it. But in a really bad market, you can have the best product in the world put together by the most amazing team ever, and you're not going to succeed. So I think that's a really compelling reason for why you should really take time to understand your market. And I think, especially with all the hype around startups these days, so many people are doing startups, I think there's more of this mythology that comes about, like, if you build it, they will come. But what's but if you really dig down and look at some of the most successful startups today and see what's going on there, what you find are these founders that are going to these extraordinary lengths to really deeply understand who their customers are. So for example, one of the founders of Airbnb didn't even own or rent a home. He would just go around and stay in different Airbnbs. Like, I don't even know what that looks like. I guess it's just like living out of a suitcase, right? Or Ben Silverman, who's the founder of Pinterest, he personally reached out to his first 5,000 users, met them for coffee, gave them his personal cell phone number. Can you imagine? And so as you're going out and you're talking to the customers um, and trying to figure out how do I go from an idea, this kind of vague idea that I have, to figuring out what is a product that's going to make sense for them. I really like this technique of customer interviews. Um, I, this is from Ash Moria. There's this book, Running Lean, which is really awesome, and it has a chapter on this. Um, but what he says is, what you should do when you're talking to customers and trying to kind of do those initial interviews and understand them better is tell them stories. Because we're human beings, and so stories resonate with us, right? 
And so if you tell them a story, like let's say the food allergy one. If you say, you know, I have a peanut allergy, and I go to restaurants, and I get things, and on the menu it doesn't say anything with peanuts, and then it comes and it has peanuts in it, um, and sometimes I ask the waiter, and they say there's no peanuts, and it comes and it does, and if I eat them, I'm going to have to go to the hospital, and it's terrible, right? And it's so bad that I don't even want to go to restaurants at all anymore. Well, if you're talking to someone who's in your target audience who has like a serious food allergy, then they're going to be like, yeah, right? That's going to resonate with them. Or even if you don't get it quite right, if you're in the general ballpark, you can say, does that even remind you of anything? And they might say, well, you know, I don't have such serious allergies that I have to go to the hospital, but if I eat something bad, then, I don't know, my face falls up and turns purple, and it's very embarrassing. <laughs> and so I don't ever want to go out on a date to a restaurant because I might turn purple, and that's not a good thing, right? So. The idea is you talk to people, you understand in their words what their own story is, right? And you start modifying the words of the story until you're going out to person after person in your audience and they're all nodding their heads. Like, yes, this is a problem I have. And when you're at that point, you know that you're onto something because these people are really desperate for a solution. So then, once you tell them the story, what you want to hear from them is what do you think are the top three problems from this? Because that's going to help you figure out how to prioritize the initial versions of the features for your product, because you want to make sure you're addressing the top problems first. And finally, we want to spend the bulk of time talking to them, is saying, what are you doing to solve these problems today? And there's a couple of reasons for this, because for one, if they say, well, I'm not really doing anything about it, then the truth is it's not that big of a problem. And so as important as you think it is what you're doing, if they think it's not that big of a problem to expend any effort on it today, there's a very low chance that unless they're like your mom or your roommate or something, that they're going to take the chance to use your startup product. So what you're really looking for, like a bottle of pain pills there, is a pain point that's so huge with them that they are trying everything that they can to get it work and to get it fixed. And they can't figure out anything. And so they're desperate for a solution, right? And they're really looking for something from you. And then, again, you just have to find a way to solve that and you've got something that people are going to be jumping at. So okay, we go back to um, our business model canvas. So the idea is you don't necessarily have all the you definitely don't have all the answers up front, but it's okay to start filling out a little bit at a time and then go talk to people and learn and do experiments and come back and keep filling this out and updating it as we learn more. So based on what we learned, um, we want to start thinking about okay, you can you might update exactly who your customer is. Um, sorry, I don't quite remember what I did here. <laughs> um, and what problem they have based on the interviews that you did with them. And then you can think about okay, what's a solution that's gonna resonate? What's something that's better? than what they're doing today for that one thing that they're dying for. Um, so we had a startup at iLab called Hupic, and it was a device that was like a toothpick that you could put in food and actually tell if a food allergen was in there. And I thought that was pretty cool, so I'm totally stealing that idea. Um, and then I took the idea of the fork, and we're happy with the fork. So what if we had a fork that could check the food ingredients that you eat? That would be a pretty cool solution, right? And then you can start thinking about a okay, unique value proposition. Um, the idea here is like a single compelling message, and this goes back to what is that story that gets getting everyone to nod their heads? This is the message that you're gonna give people that they're gonna say, yeah, I absolutely want that. So you might say, I called it Inspector Gadget, because it's kind of like a gadget that inspects your food. Um, so you might say, the unique value prop is enjoy carefree eating out with Inspector Gadget. You have to worry about turning purple, going to the hospital. And then what's your unfair advantage? Um, this one's a little bit easier than most because you probably have I'm assuming some scientific expertise on your team, maybe a patent, because it's very scientific. Um, if you're doing something that's more like a software app, you're probably not looking at a patent. Um, but you want to think about, okay, if somebody else <coughs> hears this idea, what's going to prevent them from just coming in and beating me at executing at it, right? What do you have? So maybe you've got some technical expertise to build some algorithm that's better than anybody else. Or maybe you have domain expertise that you understand that customer segment so well that you can come up with a solution that's so compelling to them. Or maybe you have really good connections that you can just reach so many more people. Like, think about it. What are you doing? What is your team able to do that's going to prevent someone else from just stealing your idea and being mad at it? And then, you know, start thinking about, okay, I figured out who my customer is. The more narrow you can get on your customer, the easier it is for you to kind of figure out how you're going to reach that customer. When it's like anyone who cooks, I don't know how you reach those people. That's ridiculous. But if it's people with serious food allergies, you can start thinking about, okay, where would I find these people? Well, they're working with a doctor. They've got a really serious food injury. Serious food allergy, right? Um, they're possibly working with a nutritionist. If they're very sensitive about what they eat, they're maybe 
eating at health food stores. So these are all possible channels. I put question marks here because you kind of want to go out and maybe talk to these people and figure out who might be a good partner to work with for this. So the more that you start filling out your canvas, the more that you want to be validating whether these ideas are right or not. And so Lean Startups is to take a scientific approach to this. Um, I like this, Thomas Edison said, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. And the truth is, the more innovative that you're being, the more ways that you're going to find that don't work. And this is pretty interesting. Um, Lean Startup basically says, you know, typically we measure our progress by how much we've executed, right? But if you build the totally wrong product, sort of like the actuality did with the holographic 3D display, it doesn't matter. You built this badass product, but nobody wants it. You didn't get any further ahead. And so when you're in this learning mode, um, in this early mode of just figuring out what your business model is, your unit of progress is learning rather than execution. And that's really huge. So many people like feel like, I just want to go heads down and build a product that I have something to show for it. It doesn't do you any good if you haven't validated that there's a real market and real business that can be made out of this. So um, if we take a scientific approach, I'm not a scientist, but as I understand, scientists start with hypotheses and then they develop experiments to validate or invalidate those hypotheses. And so the question is, what experiments can you develop to validate what's in your business model or invalidate it? And talking to customers is really good, and I can't actually overestimate how important that is to get out and talk to customers to really understand who they are and what the problem is. But you have to make sure you understand the limitations of that. What you don't want to do is validate that you have a good idea because you talk to people and they were like, yeah, they like that idea. <laughs> because if you tell somebody, hey, I'm going to develop this really cool thing, then of course they're going to say, yeah, that's a great idea. Because they're caught up in your excitement, right? And they want to encourage you. And even if they say yes or no, the truth is that human beings are just terrible at predicting our behavior, right? We have no idea if you put some product in front of us in the future that we don't even completely understand today, if we're going to want to use that or not, right? And so talk to people to understand who they are, to understand their problems, understand what they're doing today, but don't talk to them to have them predict their behavior. Instead, at that point, what you want to do is actually put something in front of them and see how they react to it. Um, so I like this quote, talk is cheap, show me the code. Um, in startup land, we might say, talk is cheap, show me the MVP. Do you guys know MVP, minimum viable product? It's kind of a love-hate relationship with that word. Um, but the idea is, what's the smallest thing that you can put in front of people to kind of validate that step and move to the next thing? So to give some examples, um, I feel like a really famous one is Dropbox. This idea of, OK, before I build something, can I find out if anyone's even interested in it or not? So Dropbox famously put together this landing page where they figured out kind of the technology, because that was important. They were doing tech that hadn't worked happened before. And then I just did this really scrappy three-minute screencast of the founder just walking through the product. Put it up on a web page, said, we haven't launched this yet, but if you're interested, give us your email address. Posted it to one place, to Hacker News, because he understood that's where his audience was, that's where like the really hardcore techies are. Over to get 75,000 signups. So that's a pretty good signal, but okay. I built something that I think they're really interested in. I can move forward to the next step. Or if you're trying to figure out if people are going to pay for this or not, because that's what you're expecting for revenue, um, a great way to do that is with, especially with a physical product, is with crowdsourcing campaigns like Kickstarter. So Pebble did this um, to create pre-orders for their watch, and they said they have a goal of $100,000. They said, unless I raise $100,000, it's not actually worth it to, me, to us to build this. They raised $10 million, <laughs> which at the time was the biggest Kickstarter ever. They recently got beat out by a cooler. Did anyone see that? Like an actual ice cooler? It's very weird. <laughs> but what I think is kind of funny is like the number was so big, it didn't even quite fit in the web page. <laughs> but that's pretty good, right? That's, again, really good validation that, yes, people are interested, people are willing to pay, and now I actually have $10 million in my pocket to go make these things. But it's not even, these are kind of some of the, I think, obvious examples that we see a lot in Lean Startup. But I think what's more interesting is to think about, OK, what are sort of some of the riskiest assumptions that I'm making? If I'm really doing something disruptive, something innovative that's different than what's been done before, um, what are assumptions that I'm making that they're, they're, they hold up to not be true? The company's going to go under. So a good example of this is Zappos. When Zappos came out, they wanted to sell shoes online. But this was like during the dot-com era, and no one was selling shoes online yet. And they're like, we don't know if people are going to be willing to buy shoes online. Maybe they want to go in the store to actually try them on, right? So we're not going to go and purchase all this shoe inventory and partner with all these people and create this big warehouse before we figure that out. It's a huge risky assumption. So what they did was they went to brick and mortar shoe stores. They took pictures of the shoes with the owner's permission. They put the pictures on the website. 
and then they tried to sell them from there. And if people bought them, they'd go to the brick and mortar shoe store, buy the shoes, and ship them to the customer. So once they figured out that, okay, people are willing to buy the shoes, and we can reach these customers and bring them to our site, and all these other things, then they said, okay, we can move on to the next step of getting the inventory ourselves. Uh, a more recent example, you know, there's so much in the sharing economy right now. One of the really early players was Get Around, and the idea was you could rent your car out to other people so they could get around. Um, but again, this was one of the really early players, and they were like, we're not really sure if anyone's going to be comfortable handing their keys to their car to a stranger. So rather than build out the tech and the solution for it and everything, they just went to a small university campus. It was like 100 people total between professors and students, and they put up sign-up sheets. Like completely low tech, right? <laughs> Do you want to rent a car? Do you want to rent your car? And then when people would fill out the sheets, they just manually connect those people. And once they saw that people were comfortable with it, they said, okay, we can go on to the next step. So it's really important to say, what are these things that I can test out before I go to build out the product? And people get really creative about it. Oh. <laughs> and then, of course, as you're doing this, you want to be constantly going back to your business model canvas and updating it based on that. And I know it can be really painful to update it because you had these ideas and you thought they were such good ideas, but it's much better to do this now and not be one of those people who fails because they stuck to their initial business plan. And I think the trickiest thing for you guys as entrepreneurs is that in order to be an entrepreneur, like it's really hard, right? You're doing something that's never been done before, and so everybody is going to be telling you, oh, that's a really stupid idea, right? And you're going to go through like a lot of lows and highs, and it's going to be crazy, and you're going to have to hear from VCs like a billion times that no, they don't want to invest in you, and everything. And so in order to make it through all of this, you have to have this incredible amount of faith in what you're doing, right? But at the same time, you can't be blinded by your faith. And so I would say if you're going through and you're doing all these experiments and you're not finding any changes to your initial business plan, you're probably not trying hard enough, right? Are you really trying the hard things? Um, so don't be blinded by that. Don't stick to the initial business plan because that leads to failure. Figure out where the weaknesses are in your plan and fix them before you actually go build out the full product. So, um, we can take a look at, go back to this food allergy example, we might come back to this based on experiments that we've done. We might decide something like, okay, customer, people with serious food restrictions, that's really broad. We want to go more narrow because even like the tech for discovering any kind of food, I imagine, would be incredibly hard. Um, and it's easier to reach a certain customer base. So maybe based on top of people, we decided that everybody seems to have a gluten allergy these days. I'm not even sure what that means, but let's start with customers who have gluten allergies, right? And maybe based on that, we change the name to something more gluten-specific. Um, and maybe we talk to, we, in doing the channels, we talk to doctors and find them really hard to work with. But nutritionists, maybe we're really excited about working with us. So maybe we say, we're just going to start with nutritionists, health food stores we can look at later. Let's see if we can make progress here. And again, the more that you go out there and the more that you learn, like this can be really intimidating to fill out at first because you're like, I have no idea what these answers are. But the more you do this, the more things start to become clear because now you say, okay, what are the key metrics that I'm using to measure my progress? Well, if you just decide your key channel is nutritionists, then obviously one of your key metrics is going to be how many nutritionists are going to be partnering with me um, and then how many sales are actually coming out of there. And then as you're understanding more about, okay, we're just looking for gluten, you can start understanding more about what your cost structure looks like. Um, your revenue is obviously coming from the nutrition sales. And you can start doing kind of a sanity check, like, okay, I don't know what these numbers would look like, but the idea is, this was your business, you would. And you can say, am I going to be able to make more money than it costs me to sell a device? If not, then what do I need to do? Do I need to think about you know, a cheaper solution? Do I need to think about more revenue channels? And you can kind of figure these things out um, as you go. And so the idea is, as you're doing these experiments and doing sort of these minimum viable products, you're kind of constantly putting out an ever improving version of your product, right? It's not like you have no product and then all of a sudden, boom, one day you have product. Um, so even the things like what Zappos did with like taking the pictures of the shoes, that was kind of their first version of their product. Um, and so the question starts to come into, okay, when do I actually launch this to the real world, right? So I'm currently testing with early users initially. Um, so going again to some wisdom from Paul Graham, he says launch when you have a quantum of utility. And so the idea here is that you want to launch when you're still pretty minimal because you want to get this in front of as many people as possible as quickly as you can, but you don't want to wait too long. Um, and the idea of the quantum of utility is you're launching something that's sufficiently better than any of the options that are out there today, and that at least some people are going to be like, yes, I'm excited that this is out because now I can finally do X. 
And something that you want to think about is this idea of launching is really, it's just a marketing concept. It doesn't have anything to do with product development cycle, right? The idea, like I said, is you're iterating on your product and you're improving it and trying different ideas as you're going through and you're running, doing all of these experiments. And a lot of people will say, oh, okay, I'm, maybe I'm working with this developer and they're going to be done on January 15th. And so I'm going to launch it to the world on January 15th. Do you want all these people using your product for the first time when it's never been used by anybody before? That's kind of like a really scary, terrifying idea. I would not want to do that. I don't care how good the developer was, right? In GLA, you want to do sort of a soft launch where your product's already in pe real people's hands. They're using it. You're kind of working out the kinks with them. You're figuring out something that resonates with them and works well. And then by the time you finally do your big marketing launch, and maybe you get in TechCrunch or something, then you've got a product that's really stable and you're comfortable with, and you can say, hey, we've already got X number of users, right? So push off the launch, focus on kind of that learning feedback from the initial versions of your product rather than the launch, even though the launch is sexy. And what you are ultimately looking for as you're going through all of these versions of your product is product market fit. Um, this is also a term from Mark Anderson, and he says, uh, so product market fit, of course, is when you figure out what the right product is for the right market. Um, and he says that a great market, so that thing that he said was awesome to get, a market with lots of real potential customers. The market pulls the, start, the product out of the startup. So ideally, as you're going through and you're working with customers and you're giving these different versions of your products, you want the customers to be saying, yes, this really helps me, right? This is really what I want to be seeing. So that is sort of the startup utopia. And that's what I've got for Idea to Launch. Um, here are some Lean Startup resources. Eric Reese, of course, is the creator of Lean Startup. Um, I didn't really get too far into customer development, but that was you know, how to develop your customers. Um, come from Steve Blank. And Ash Moria has some great things like running Lean um, and the Creative Lean Canvas as well. And then I've got stuff on my website. So, do you guys have any questions? And I have another book for your question. Yeah. So, like, say you have a good idea, but you don't know, like, you don't know the first thing about coding or where to begin because it's solely just like an internet idea. Where would you suggest the best places to start? Because you don't want to just be like giving out your idea to everyone because you're just trying to find one person who's like willing to work on your team, but you're also caught in like you want to find someone who wants to like be interested in your products. Like, where would you suggest is the first step? Yeah. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna answer two things in that. So the first is the idea that you don't want to be giving out your idea to everybody. I would go back to this notion of if your idea, if you feel like somebody else could take your idea and beat you at it, then I don't think you're the right one to be doing that idea. You should have, be bringing something to it either by you or by you and your team and your advisors that this is so natural that you can give out the idea to everyone in the world and they're not going to be able to beat you at it because you have some kind of special sauce. Um, so really think about that. As far as, do you mean finding developers or teaching yourself to code or? Finding. <laughs> so finding developers is, very difficult. Um, I feel like it's a little easier for students, like if you have any, um, like we have Hack Harvard at Harvard, I don't know if you have any um, CS groups here that have mailing lists that you maybe you can reach out to if you have something really cool. But the idea is, in order to get anyone to want to come on your team, you have to have something that's really compelling to them. And so if all you have an idea is an idea, everybody has an idea, right? And so what have you done that if you have something where you can really show traction, that maybe you have like some amazing connections in the industry, and so if this is built, you can guarantee it's going to get sold. Or maybe you've already like hacked something together yourself, even though you're not a coder, and you've been able to get people to use it, and that's like amazing traction. And people are interested in that. So not just investors, but people who want to join your team, like coders. And so a lot of people have had a lot of success with teaching themselves just enough coding that they can hack something together. Not that you're going to be the ultimate CTO, um, if that makes sense. What would you say are some like unfair advantages if your product is something easy to replicate, like a mobile app? Um, yeah, so again, it gets to what is something that you have that's going to be hard for others to replicate? And so it might be that you're doing something really technologically hard. Um, so like you have some crazy algorithm that's really cool. What if it's simple? What if it's simple? <laughs> um, so, I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. So how are you going to get people to use your app if it's really simple and other, and other people can do it? Other people can create the same thing. Just like reaching out to people, just like the founding 
projects that you find that advantage? The founders. Like, is it just in like the team that you find the advantage if you or something like simple like that? I mean, a lot. Yeah, a lot of times it's coming from the team that they have some technical expertise or some domain expertise or they have some connections. Sometimes it's bringing on awesome advisors that have that for you. Um, but again, I feel like a lot of these things are kind of the same questions. It's, it's similar to the idea and like, how do you get programmers to want to join your team? How do you get people to not beat you? How do you get customers to want to use you? Right? It's all kind of what are you doing that other people that's going to make you stand out above the rest? Um, I think what's interesting right now is because startups are so hyped up, so many people want to do a startup. And kind of everybody can see, like this is where technology is, right? Um, kind of see, this is the limit of technology right now. But people want to be here and everybody can see what those gaps are and so everybody's going after it. And so you have to figure out, if you want to address a gap, what are you bringing to it that's going to make you different than everybody else? And that's your uh, what do you think about people who have been within an industry, whether or not that's a good or a bad thing? It's like Paul Graham talks about, you want to be on the edge of the industry and then just do what isn't there yet. But like, Jack Dorsey will talk about people in the finance industry and never could have created Square. So, <laughs> the people in the finance industry? <coughs> they never could have created Square. Oh, right, right, they, I know. They think they're all Yeah, um, I don't know, I feel like there's interesting innovations happen when you kind of bring together two ideas that nobody, or two disciplines that nobody thought of bringing together before, um, perspective to things. So I think it's really important to have someone with the domain expertise. I'll be honest, I sometimes see startups succeed that did not have the domain expertise at all, and it baffles me how they were able to figure that out, maybe good advisors. Um, but then also kind of bringing that fresh perspective so that you can look at something completely differently. I don't know that that's a very good answer. Yeah. So like you creating and developing a product, <coughs> sorry, um, there's a lot of different aspects to it, right? Like first off, you know, we're BC, so there's a disadvantage that we don't have like engineers. But in terms of like accessing raw materials, you know, to even get to that point where you can develop, like do you have any recommendation to like how do you even reach out and get access to that? Is that like reach out and get access to I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. Access to like into like raw materials to kind of even like put something together. Like I, I it's just hard for me to picture, you know, like thinking of a physical product itself and then me just going around campus like getting like raw materials. Oh, know. so you mean more on the hardware development side, yeah. not on the software development not side? Not necessarily on the oh. software. Yeah. Um, um, so like what kind of raw materials do you mean? I guess, can you tell me a little bit more about the... Do you want me to just like full yeah. batch? Yeah. Right. Oh, <laughs> tell me what the idea yeah. is. <laughs> uh, so I'm a lacrosse player and um, you know, it's an emerging market. It's like the growing, fastest growing sport in the country, and uh, a lot of high schools and colleges are starting to adapt to it, right? And um, an interesting aspect of lacrosse is that the lacrosse balls themselves are made out of rubber, okay. and that they um, they have a, the shortest lifespan out of any other sport. So lacrosse balls come and go really fast because of exposure to dirt and UV rays. So there's this constant cycle of replacing re uh, lacrosse balls, and because um, just, you just can't use them anymore. So right. I kind of like borrowed some technology and created a really basic prototype to refurbish the cross balls. And in terms of um, you know implementing that, like the process itself works, but in terms of implementing it to a point where you can automate it and then where you can um, you know add a couple different aspects to the machine where I just have no expertise to, I'm just like for me, I basically just outsourced the machine itself to an existing technology where someone was turning. You know, like rocks into perfect spheres. I okay. just adapted it, and I so I just kind of adapted that technology. But in terms of changing that, like a couple of things I would add would be like a hopper at the top to put like multiple lacrosse balls, so you could just automate it and run it like full circle. But in terms of reaching out to specialized engineers or even like getting access to you know raw materials to even develop like a hopper, I'm just totally lost. So Yeah, I feel like that gets back to when something is kind of the core competency of yours, I feel like you really need someone on your team, like on your founding team that is the materials engineer that really understands that stuff. Right. Um, otherwise it's going to be really tricky. You can outsource it, but if you can outsource it, it kind of gets back to why couldn't somebody else then take your idea and just go outsource it and beat you on it. Right. Um, yeah, I feel like that's the answer. I mean, there are places like um, 
Dragon Innovation is a Boston company and they help a lot of hardware companies with understanding manufacturing, like scaling manufacturing up and distribution and doing crowdsourcing and things like that. Um, so you might look into resources like that, but I think I would, I would try to find somebody who has that expertise, who right. wants to at least be an advisor. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. What are some of the most common questions you get from uh, student teams at the outlet? Or maybe common issues that you see? Oh, the most common question I get by far is how do I find a developer? <laughs> Which I don't have a good answer to um, because everyone's looking for developers. Um, I don't know. I think, I feel like a lot of teams are asking <laughs> questions before, like a little bit too early. Like they want to know all the information up front. And I feel like part of doing a startup is kind of being a comfortable with this fact that you're not going to know all the answers up front, you need to just go out and be doing experiments and learning. Um, what are specific questions? I don't know why I get such a range. Let me think about that a little more. <laughs> yeah? Uh, which of the best uh, startup meets in Boston, Cambridge, around this area, where you could just meet up other entrepreneurs and other people who are interested to work in startups? Yeah, um, so I was doing the Lean Startup Meetup, but I haven't been doing that lately. So, um, you know, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Um, a really good thing is if you go on Meetup, yeah. You can search for startup, um, and then there's startup calendars like greenhornconnect.com has a startup calendar and venturefiz.com has startup calendars, and those are really great. Um, I feel like I'm just not quite up on what's still active. There's things like ultralight startups and Boston Tech, but I find that there's a whole lot of different ones. Or some of the interesting ones are when there's events that are very in focused on a specific discipline. So like there's some cool food tech one that I've seen. So like if you're interested in doing something around food, you can go to that. Um, I would take a look at the calendar and see like what's in the area. So do you have a specific area that you're interested in? No, not as such. I'm okay. actually interested in the startup from the VC perspective. Oh. So I want to be, I want to understand and be more active in the community. Okay, okay. Um, maybe go to the Nevka Nevi Awards. I can't remember what, when they are. They cost a little bit of money. But they have, so Nevka is the New England Venture Capital Association. Um, oh, and they have... Say? the New England Venture Capital Association, and they do Nevi Awards, um, where they give awards to entrepreneurs and investors who are doing awesome things in the community. Um, so that's kind of cool, like, get some good meeting of people there. Um, Unpitch is an event, but applications just closed for that. So that's an event that I help organize, where, um, if you heard of that, so the idea is that investors buy entrepreneurs lunch <laughs> um, so that we help make connections between entrepreneurs and investors that might not have been able to make those connections easily and we're a very like low stress casual have lunch environments so that's cool too um, yeah I guess I guess there's the kind of recurring monthly meetups which are fun but I think the kind of one-offs like unpitch or you know food tech specific are more interesting than the ones that happen every month in my experience yeah going back to the example Hologram company. What would you have done instead? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I know the founder, he's brilliant, and so I don't know all of the details of what he did, so not understanding fully what he did. Um, I think what they needed to do was, uh, supposedly their customer was going to be companies, right, because this is going to be a very expensive device, is go to different companies in the industry and understand which ones had problems that might be able to be solved with a 3D holographic display, right? And then um, I feel like one of the problems that I heard that they had is they created this holographic display, but then it was very hard to get anything to it because you can't just hook up your computer to it. Like the computer knows how to do 2D, right, on a flat screen. And so someone have to write custom code to actually make it display 3D. And who has the capabilities to do that? But if they knew, um, for example, I knew for a while they were working with like surgeons to kind of understand the inside of what people look like so they could see what was going on there. Um, if they knew that that was the application, then maybe they wrote something that worked with their equipment instead of having people to have to write custom code for it and then they kind of customize the solution to the product to make sense for that. Anything else? I'm sorry, I have not given up, but um, someone asked another question, not give up. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Uh, what's the most successful startup that you've ever worked with? The most successful startup that I've ever worked with. Um, oh, this is actually kind of fun. Is um, do you guys know Crashlytics? They got bought by Twitter. So um, Jeff and Wayne actually. So when I was at Microsoft, it's kind of cool because Microsoft just I got to use their budget to go help startups and. Um, there was this group called Dart Boston, which unfortunately isn't around anymore, I don't think. They were really cool. They kind of helped um, students and like recent grads to kind of integrate into the startup community and meet people. And they did these family dinners where they would bring like influencers from the community um, out to dinner at this really nice restaurant and invite like a bunch of students and recent grads so that they could have like these informal dinner conversations with them. And so I sponsored one the one that the two founders of Crashlytics met at. <laughs> and then so Crashlytics um, does, helps developers who are doing mobile apps to understand where their apps are crashing. So it gives them all these analytics around it. And like in a year and a half or something, maybe two years at the most, they were bought by Twitter. So that was pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah? Um, so I know there's like a lot of hype around, oh, my, you know, my startup has to do with tech and app. Um, how, how would you say is like the space for startups that don't have a tech app? And should they be trying to figure out if they're, you know, if tech can be applicable for the startup? Um, I mean, yeah, I wish so. Like Harvard is really interesting to me because we get this huge diversity of startups, and maybe you guys do here too, which is really cool. I don't see it so much in the Boston community. Um, where about a third of the startups that come through our incubator are what we call social entrepreneurship. Um, I don't know a whole lot about that space. So we have somebody else who helps them, um, but. So the question is, should they be thinking about tech? I mean, if that makes sense, the truth is, if there's things that you can do that don't require tech, sometimes low-tech solutions can be just as effective. Um, I guess just kind of figuring out, I think even for people who are thinking about tech, a lot of times you can start with a very low-tech solution, and then as you start hitting critical mass, where you need to be able to scale, then you can start saying, how can I apply technology to this? Sure. space right now. Um, so I'm really excited by what's going on like with robotics and consumer robotics is really interesting. Um, and so I was just on a panel with, oh my god, Jiva, oh gosh, it's being videoed and I'm not going to remember the name of <laughs> um, It's a robot. It's actually very similar to, what's the one that Amazon just came out with? Kiva. Not Kiva. No, it's like some device that you can talk to, right? And I think the idea is that you could just be like, Amazon, order me some batteries, uh -huh. right? <laughs> um, but it's a device that just kind of listens. So I feel like it's called Jibo. It's, the, it's a very similar concept. Um, and it can do all these things for you, hands free, so you can just talk to it. Um, it can like take pictures of you, so you don't have to you know, worry about figuring out someone else to take pictures. Um, I just think there's a lot of exciting things in that space. I think there's a lot of exciting things in the Internet of Things space. Um, but right now it's so techy and like the wearable space, like I feel like it's so techy and gadgety. I don't think it's, it's like neat, but it's not very useful. But there's a lot of potential there to really do things that are useful. Um, so that's a neat space. I think, I don't know, I guess I think of a lot of stuff around like 3D printing, Internet of Things, um, big data, like what can you do if you can aggregate all this data especially if you combine those things. Like, if you can aggregate the data from, say, the bike that like tracks your riding and the fork that tracks your eating habits, and your fork can tell your bike, hey, you ate too much in dinner, <laughs> you should bike an extra 10 miles, right? Things start getting really interesting. <laughs> There's also some good advice I heard, although this is a couple years old ago, but I feel like it's still valid. And um, I think it was Steve Papa that said this, and he said, think of a space that nobody is thinking of right now and figure out what mobile is doing to that space. And so his example, Uber was very young at the time, but like taxis, nobody's thinking about taxis. And so what could Uber do to that? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Just a reminder, um, these quarter sheets here are meant on Sunday. There's a bit.ly link on there. Also, PayPal and Boston on uh, Friday this week. There's a bunch of cookies and soda back there. Please take some. Uh, there's a lot left. So thanks again for coming out.